Hey everybody, welcome to the latest edition of Volley. I'm Carolyn April and I'm here with my good friend Seth Robinson. Hey Seth. Hey, how are you doing? Doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. Um, I'm trying to think what's going on in my world. I think since the last time we did it Volley, uh, I actually went on my first business trip. In yeah, almost, how did that go? Almost two years. Um, it was interesting. I went to Vegas for the Channel Partners event. So it was my first flight in about 19 months, I think it was. I went and figured the last time I was on a plane. Um, it was, I mean, the masking part of it was is the only thing. I mean, that was a long flight. You know, short flight wouldn't have been so bad. But from the East Coast to Vegas, it was a good five and a half hours on the plane and then in the airport. So you got to get used to that part. Um, and then Vegas itself, the city is in a mask mandate. It's not doing like, it's very different than it is here where there's, um, uh, the rules are pretty relaxed here. Um, but not so in Vegas. So that was interesting to go to a giant conference where everybody, you haven't seen people in a really long time and they're still, they're like, Hey, is that you? You know, but, um, you know, otherwise it actually seemed like a regular conference. Um, they had good attendance and I would not have noticed much different other than the masking. Hmm. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I, I know that you uh, were really anxious to to get out on the road again and uh, start doing that. And yeah. I haven't been as much. I mean, I was even at a restaurant last night just picking up food, not not eating there, but just picking up food to bring it home. And it really wasn't even a COVID thing. I just felt like, oh, all these people, like, why? I don't want to be around these people. So, like, you know, COVID really allowed me to lean into my hermit tendencies. I was going to say, you're really, you know, you're going full on introvert now. Like, just stay home. Don't like, come out of your cave. Oh, um, gosh. I, I think, that, no, I think some people went that way. You know, that's actually, it has, it has um, had you lean in and other people to that. I know people who are like loving that this happened, not the COVID part of it, but the, the, uh, the staying home all the time part of it. Um, but there were lots of people I saw at the conference who were just excited beyond belief to get out and see human beings again and they have familiar faces. Um, so I think it can go either way. We'll see what 2022 looks like on the travel front for all of us. And speaking of 2022, that's what we're going to talk about today. Right? Yeah, it's a good segue into our, our topic for today. I was talking it with is. our producer, Andrea, before the show started here and saying that it really feels like the end of the year is coming. I think, you know, for the two of us, mm -hmm. we've gotten kind of, you know, rhythm of the end of the year. And, you know, yeah. we do our holiday episode with Randy and then we we push out our 2022 IT industry outlook. And and then that, that really starts to signal the end of the year. So I can really feel it yeah. coming on. And uh, we did publish the report today. So everyone can check that out on comptia.org. And before we get started, there's actually, I think, a disclaimer that I should throw out there about this report. You know, when we do all of our reports, we usually start the report three months before it gets published. And usually that works out fine. You know, not, not too much can happen in three months, but every once in a while, there's a little quirk of timing or something will pop, you know, pretty big. So maybe I release a security report two weeks after some you know, mega breach or something like that. And I think in this yeah. case, we with that with the IT industry outlook, we usually struggle with that a little bit more than most of the other reports, just because things can happen at the end of the year. And I think with this one, when we started writing the report, people were talking about metaverse, but not a ton. But in the past two weeks, it's really jumped into the spotlight, mostly because of Facebook doing their name change. Yeah. And we it, it was definitely kind of on the fringes of something that we almost wrote about, but we didn't write about it. And now, you know, here we're putting out this outlook and we're putting it out at a time when everyone's talking about metaverse uh, and we didn't talk about it at all. So you're not going to find that in the outlook and maybe we'll come back to it, you know, in a volley or something like that. But uh, that is definitely not in there but there's a lot of other great stuff that is in there yeah that's one of the um you know one of the potential uh hiccups to doing any sort of report that involves um some prognostication about the future or looking at the trends literally what you talk about today could be upended tomorrow and and i think COVID has really put that into uh sharp view for all of us that, um, you know, the way your world looks one day could be very different the next. But I think what we've encapsulated in our in this report, um, pretty much um, other than, you know, metaverse and other and we could probably point to other things. You can't include everything. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think what we have included here is a good um, indicator of what is going on in the tech industry from 
uh, a kind of macro industry perspective, but also from the viewpoint of uh, IT professionals and from the viewpoint of the IT channel, which is what we tend to, we, that is what we try to cover when we do the report. So I'm excited about it. I think we've got some good things to talk about here. Yeah, the, the overall theme was return to strategy, because mm -hmm. I think in both the data set that I collected around IT professionals and the data set that you collected around channel firms, we saw people um, going back to the mindset that we had seen forming prior to the pandemic. And, and that is where you're really having to balance the, the tactical side of IT and the strategic side. And they, they have very different uh, goals and, and behaviors. And during the pandemic, we saw a lot of companies, you know, the vast majority of companies really had to focus on the tactical side to deal with remote workforce, you know, or to digitize their operations or whatever it is. And I think now that we're, you know, coming out of it, certainly a lot of, you know, businesses across the economy, the global economy have probably, you know, not survived, but I think those that did um, are, are returning to that dual mode of IT. Uh, and we can see it, you know, in budgets, we can see it in, things that they are attempting to have as initiatives next year, you know, hiring skills, all, all of those things. We see the, the balance, right? It's not like everyone's just abandoning the tactics, but we definitely see that strategic part coming back into it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, if you look at uh, from the channel side of things, uh, things got very tactical over the last couple of years. Um, there are companies that didn't make it. That's very much true. Uh, there are companies that throttled back dramatically and, and they're still afloat, but they didn't, you know, they were not pursuing innovative, you know, uh, projects. They were, you know, growth was, let's just try to stay, you know, above the line um, if we possibly can. Um, not a lot of new hiring was going on. And what we're seeing is, um, I think in the data is a return to some optimism. It's like, okay, let's all take a deep sigh. I think we've, you know, for those of us who survived this, um, things are looking up, knock on wood, and hopefully this coming year we can return to some of those uh, strategic projects. And and we're seeing that, you know, right in the data about the, the types of things that companies are looking to do and think, you know, are going to help them pursue revenue growth in the coming year. And one of the things I noted from the channel is that, you know, the number one item that tops the list as a factor that's gonna drive growth next year is pursuing new customers and new customer segments. That was not the case for the last two years. It was holding on to existing customers was number one. Now, and that was that was the mode that companies went into. It's like, all right, we've got, let's just use, you know, a hypothetical, we've got 10 customers, we wanna keep them and maybe sell them some additional things. This year, we've got those 10 customers, we wanna to cater to them as well, but we wanna get 10 more. And I, I see that as a positive sign. So that means they're gonna ramp up sales and marketing efforts. Um, they may be taking on new skills and, you know, the number two thing that, company said would help them drive growth is to get into new business lines, new product areas, new services areas. So they're really thinking um, aggressively as we move into the new year. And I think that's a, you know, a good sign. Obviously, I think it also means that the channel thinks these IT professionals are going to be buying again and opening their purse strings so that you know they will be the customers they can sell to. Yeah, when you Think about the data that you saw there with with channel firms wanting to get into new customers and and you think about the experience you've had with these channel firms and, and the ones that you know, uh, you know, what do you think the mix will be of, of firms that are trying to maybe just ramp up their sales and marketing and take their current offerings into a broader set of customers and the firms that might actually be trying to do something different? Because I think we've seen both sides of the equation, um, yeah. you know, coming out of technology firms for the past several years. Uh, and so I was just curious, you know, what you think that that mix might actually play out to be moving forward. You know, everyone will be going after new customers, but how exactly will they be going about doing that? Yeah, I like the way that you just broke that into two different kind of segments. There's certainly going to be uh, channel firms that um, maintain sort of the traditional business model that they have today, and they just are more aggressively going to look for more customers that fit into that model. Um, but what we're seeing is among some of the more um, forward thinking, is a good way to put it, um, channel firms, there's a pivot going on, or newer channel firms that might be coming into the fray here. Um, toward different types of business models, not new products to sell necessarily, but really a new business model altogether. And one of the trends, we should probably talk about that, is that as we do with every one of our Outlook reports, we 
uh, we do include 10 trends that we think are kind of going on in the industry and will continue to do so in, in the, the coming year. And one of them was about um, sort of the new road that some channel firms are going to take in moving away in this cloud environment that we have today with a lot of as a service, everything and competition from things like online marketplaces for where the buyer is going to buy. Um, the channel firms that are smart about this are moving into areas like consulting very heavily, and they are moving away from being a transactional type of provider where they're selling their customer products. And I think that's where you're going to see a lot of movement in the coming year is the channel company is going to realize, you know, we may not be the go-to for the thing, the it, whatever it is that the company um, that we work with is going to be buying. They may go elsewhere for that, but we are the it for helping them figure out what they should buy, uh, let them handle the transaction then afterwards. And we are the it for helping them figure out what to do with that product or service whether it's an as-a-service software you know, application or, or something more tangible like a product in, in on-premise, we're going to help them figure out what to do with that afterwards because they may not know that they need to secure it, you know, deal with compliance issues, figure out how to integrate it with the rest of their environment. And we can very lucratively, um, I will add, um, provide those kinds of services going forward. So I think it's really going to be a shift toward being much more consultative in the model that you have. And you're going to see, and we we already see channel firms that don't take title to any products whatsoever. They're not selling them anymore. They are selling their expertise and services. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that makes sense. And I, I, I think I agree with you that, you know, we probably won't see too many current firms that, that are in what we've been calling the channel really try to pivot their business model, really try to address new technology solutions, but for those firms that do try to do that and become, you know, the it for a technology solution, um, one of the things that I was thinking when I asked you that question was one of the trends that that we wrote about um, around software, and we right. don't talk about software too terribly much uh, here at CompTIA. Uh, it's just not been part of the audiences that we serve. You know, they've, they've mostly focused on infrastructure and cybersecurity mm -hmm. on both the channel side and the IT pro side, but. The, the trend that we wrote about in this report was about software becoming more granular. And this is kind of the next step in a progression that we've seen over years of, of companies not just writing monolithic applications, but breaking it down into smaller parts and, and doing micro architecture. And I think it's getting even smaller and smaller and they're looking for reusable pieces, uh, you know, not just small pieces that can be updated, you know, individually. And I think that's interesting in and of itself, but I think kind of the underlying theme with software is that it's really beginning to weave its way into almost any technology solution that you think of. And, and so, like I said, our audiences typically haven't focused on software, but I think for any firms or IT professionals that want to maybe drive forward um, in a little bit more of a strategic pathway, they're probably going to have to get a little more familiar with software, maybe not even having development skills, but I think understanding how software is driving things, whether that's e-commerce, customer service, mm -hmm. th things like that. I, I think we still just see a pretty big gap there, you know, between companies that truly understand software and are leveraging it um, to drive their business forward and companies that are kind of, you know, just moving products around or, or IT professionals that are, that are servicing products primarily. Yeah. Well, one of the things about software that we're seeing, and it fits into one of the biggest trends probably going on in the channel today, and it affects customers as well, is this whole um, mantra around customer experience and how important it is to provide a very good, um, superior almost customer experience when you're dealing with your customers, not just in the sales process and the recruiting process, but also in how you deal with them over the full life cycle of the uh, relationship. So communications, and a lot of that does come down to some software. It comes down to you know how you develop your website, what are some of the widgets that you use, and 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 in some ways I've seen some channel firms they do they do um, uh, double down a little bit on development skills, and they're creating um, little pieces of software that would not stand alone necessarily. They were not products that you would sell applications, but they're things that are repeatable that help them connect and 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 scale the types of services and, and process that they um, that they do with each individual customer. So I think software skills are something that um, at least channel firms are going to have to take a look at going forward, especially as 
um, they really get more involved in the integration work of those applications that customers are buying on their own. So uh, they're buying them on their own and then they're like, well, what do, how do we connect this CRM thing that we just downloaded from a marketplace to, you know, backend databases or whatever it is we need to access. And there's a level of skill there that does involve some development activity. Um, so I, I, I certainly think this trend is, is spot on. I think that companies who are not focusing at least a little bit on the software expertise within their organization are a little remiss um, yeah. and missing out on what could be, you know, a, a pretty lucrative opportunity for them. And likewise, for IT pros, it's pretty smart to have some some development uh, skills with in-house. Probably yeah. a good probably a good pivot to hiring and skills and all of that, because that seemed to be a big part of, uh, of our outlook this year. As people look um, to expand their budgets and dive into new areas, they're, ne- they're gonna need people. So human resources and what skills they have are probably gonna be another big thing that we'll be talking about for the coming year. Yeah, I mean, I think that software in particular, cybersecurity you know, is another area that are really going to be tight uh, in terms of you know, the supply of skilled professionals. But I think across the board, you know, you could be talking about, you know, help desk or network administrators um, or, you know, in the data side, uh, which is a little bit newer for a lot of companies. But I think across the board, there is this skills crunch and there has been for a while. And I think it's projected to just keep getting worse. And so, you know, companies are definitely looking at hiring, but can they find the people? And, And I think that tied in, you know, with what you said about seeing a little bit more of a boost in intent to hire, uh, is th- probably one of the biggest topics that we're going to keep an eye on over the next year where, you know, business and technology are intersecting. And that's where are you getting people from and where do they stay located? And, you know, how is a business going to deal with having a remote workforce or trying to bring people back into the office? I, I don't think we necessarily came down on one side or another in the report because we see it as as something that is going to be a fluid situation over the next yeah. year. I, I think there are a lot of dynamics here and a lot of the news stories that, that I see seem like they want to make it simple. And it, it seems like they want to say, yep, everyone just still wants to work at home. And I think that, I, I think there are definitely a lot of nuances there. I think there's maybe you know, I've talked to people that they they might want to stay at home, but they also want to see people in the office. Like they ultimately want, you know, a hybrid yeah. situation. I mean, as we discussed at the top of the episode here, I'm, you know, really leaning into my introvert tendencies and, and I'm not necessarily wanting to go in too much, but I, I think that I might be in the minority. Uh, and I think a lot of people, you know, want to, to go in, especially new people coming into the workforce for the first time. They don't want to start their job just sitting at a desk. Um, and then you've got on the business side, you know, some businesses that feel like it's very important for their people to be there um, for, for whatever reason. And they may be a little misguided or they might be, you know, right about being able to capture some efficiency. And so I think there's going to be a tug of war all through next year. And I think that finding talent is really going to contribute to the tug of war one way or another um, mm-hmm. as companies try to figure out, do we want to have people remote and how do we handle that? And you know, what technology do we use to enable that? Um, and, and how often do we bring them in? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be easily solved. I think if anything, the past couple of years have shown us that you can work with a remote workforce. Let's. I, I think that that, generally speaking, that has been um, the conclusion is that most companies were able to manage with their their workforce going remote or mostly remote. The other reality is all jobs are different. So you know some jobs just are not meant for a remote role or they don't work as well in a remote setting as they do in the office there and then then there are the obvious types of jobs that you just physically need to be there um and so i think the hybrid model is going to uh be the one that we go with going forward um but as far as hiring and finding the right people i think it gets stickier because i do believe that the leverage now um exists with employees potential employees. I think that for many job roles, um, they're going to have more of the upper hand in determining where they work, how they work. Um, And if they are interviewing with an employer who is a, you must come to the office and they are absolutely not the type that wants to go back to an office, they have other places they can go. 
I mean, I don't know how long that's going to, you know, be the case, but right now I do think the, that the, um, you know, the choice is really going to be more in the hands of employees who are looking for new jobs than it is for, uh, for employers who are going to have to extend some flexibility. You know, I, I mean, I'm biased because I've always been a remote worker. So for me, I can't, you know, I see no difference in to being here working for the type of job that I do than going to an office and shutting my door for eight hours. Um, but I know that there are people that like thrive on the whole culture thing. And, and I, you know, and so I, I understand that that, you know, that becomes an issue too. I, I, I don't know. It's so funny because it's human nature. It's like, what do people feel more comfortable doing? What to employ? You have old school employers who want to see their employees, but you've read a million McKinsey and Harvard Business Re Review, you know, reports on, you know, the employee just being seen sitting at their desk doesn't mean they're more productive. And we all know that, you know, productivity is not, a, is, is not determined in a, in a formula by the fact that you're sitting in your office. So, um, I think it's going to be very interesting to watch what the world of work looks like over the next few years. But I do think it's permanently changed. Yeah, I, I think that it might be wise for businesses to try to be patient on this one, you know, for, for a couple of the reasons that you mentioned, right, that that it's it's kind of situational for the job. Yeah. Um, and and then people's dynamics in their lives are, are still changing, you know, in the data that I collected from IT professionals, it, it actually seems to kind of kick against the the typical headlines that we're seeing. The the data that I collected had IT professionals saying, you know, we we think that my our companies might require us to come back, but a relatively low percentage of those people that thought they were going to be required to come back were saying that I'm I'm going to look for another job. Like I'm I'm out of here if that's what my company requires. I think a lot of them seem to be saying like, yeah, that that would be okay. And I think that some other data points showed that the the IT professionals felt like there were definitely some challenges in doing their job from home. They they can get it done, but maybe it takes longer to solve problems. Maybe the employees that are coming to them for help don't use the, the channels as much as as they 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 should whether it's you know social media channels or, or internal slack channels or whatever it is um and it's it's just a little easier more efficient or more productive when you're in person and they're coming by and they they've got a problem and you can you know troubleshoot it right there so it seemed from my data which is just you know one data point in this huge huge issue that a lot of it pros are kind of saying eh, you know i I don't need to be full-time remote. I, I, at a minimum, I'm okay with a hybrid situation and maybe I'll just, you know, go back to the office full-time um, whether my company requires it or not, you know, kind of a personal preference thing. And and so I think that there are still so many dynamics and this, this shock that we've had to our system was so massive that I think it's going to take a while to sort out and for people to kind of figure out what their preferences are. And so even if they do have the leverage um, they need to figure out for themselves what they want to do with it. Uh, and so if you're, a, if you're a business and you're not needing to make an immediate decision about whatever real estate you're holding or anything like that, right. then maybe just, you know, a loose hand here uh, is, is a good way to be moving forward and, and just sort of let, let the employees kind of figure out what it's going to be, start mm -hmm. to figure out what your steady state might look like, you know, in the long term, and then make decisions from there rather than, trying to make any decisions, you know, right now at the beginning of a year and, and, and not having the full picture before you do that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think right now it's finding our way and it's, I think it, it is um, smart for an employer to remain flexible right now and just sort of figure out what, where their employees um, kind of sit on this and the fact that they may change their mind, you know, today I want to be in the office tomorrow. I don't kind of thing. One of the upsides though, I think to, um, to opening your doors to remote workers though, is while we have this kind of skills crunch, is you're casting a wider net when you're hiring. If you really need a specific type of employee with a specific, very specific skill set, whether that's in cybersecurity or software development, as we talked about, and you're having trouble finding somebody right in your region, um, the fact that you have now have vast experience perhaps working with knowledge workers who are remote, um, you're able to then take your recruitment efforts and go far afield of, of headquarters, which may help you fill those spots that have been really tricky for you to fill. So I wanted to point that out as one of the maybe pluses 
of um, being more flexible about remote work arrangements. Yeah, well, I think we've done a good job of covering some of the highlights of, of the report. Like you mentioned, there's, there's a lot in here. There's, there's a lot, a lot in, in there. there. There's the 10 trends that you mentioned. There's a section mm -hmm. on, on just the overall industry and sort of the size and shape, you know, heading into 2022. And then there's a section on IT pros and there's a section on, on the business of technology in the channel. Um, so there's a lot in there. It's live on the website. We're going to be covering some specific topics on Trendwatch uh, over the next four episodes yeah. of Trendwatch. So definitely check out uh, the CompTIA Connect YouTube channel for those episodes if you're not already doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, check out check out the full report. So it's uh, I think it's a good one. It's definitely, like you said at the beginning, uh, nice to see a little bit of optimism returning. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think this year was a kind of a bumpy ride, um, but hopefully next year is a little bit more smooth sailing. Yeah, I think um, 2020 was, was, was just, you know, blew everybody's world away. Um, and I think when we did this report last year, looking ahead to the current year that we're in 2021, we all sort of thought that things were going to get better. And then, of course, we had the Delta variant crop up. And, and so 2021 didn't pan out exactly the way that we wanted it to. Um, but I get better vibes about next year. And I can tell in the data that we've collected here, not just for this report, but for some other reports that we've been doing, that people and companies are ready to kind of approach um, this coming year with, you know, some new, some new view views and some more, I guess, optimistic thoughts about strategy, just to go back to our theme and, yeah. and to start to think, you know, to do the big think type of thing again, instead of just the staying alive kind of thinking, which is what we've been in bunker yeah. mode, I guess. Yeah. Well, coming, coming out of our bunkers, not you, you're staying in yours. I'm but, staying, in, staying in forever. Yeah. yeah no, you're staying in your bunker, but we'll, <laughs> but hopefully the rest of the world is coming out. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll we'll be back here, you know, hopefully again next year, and uh, hopefully yes. we'll be able to say, yeah, the optimism was warranted. It was it was a good year. So I think so. I'm looking. I, I, I'm optimistic myself. So anyway, my friend, I will uh, talk to you soon in a few weeks, and we'll get another volley under our belt. But uh, here's to 2022, folks. Look. And the end of this year. Yeah, yep, for sure. Uh, thanks as always to our producer, Andrew McMillan, and I'll talk to you next time. Sounds good.